Hey, what is up, everybody? Welcome to the Guilty as Charged podcast. My name is Steven, and I am the host, as always. And joining me is my guy, Tyler. Tyler, what's up, man? How are you doing tonight? I'm doing pretty well. You know, I watched the film, or at least the defensive side of the film, and uh, there were things to celebrate for sure about that side of the ball. Um, not so great stuff as well, but, you know, you feel like the defense is maybe turning a corner and improving, and certainly holding the Cowboys to 20. You feel pretty good, so... After getting it out of our system and talking about it the night of the game and the, the day after the game for the Chargers channel and a little bit today, like like as you said on the Chargers show, we're going to flush it out of our system. We flushed it out of our system. Uh, I'm, I have the tiniest bit of optimism left and I'm holding on to that. Yeah, I think that's a fair way to phrase that. And listen, like it's going to be hard for Justin Herbert and Kellen Moore to be worse than they were. Um, it wasn't even really that bad. It was just yeah, an off night for both of them. And um, those are two gentlemen who are, are pretty damn good at their jobs. So the offense should be better. If the defense really has turned a corner, um, then this team should be in a, in a decent spot going forward. The schedule does not get any easier. It obviously starts with the Kansas City Chiefs this week. Um, next week against the Bears should be relatively easy. Knock on wood. Uh, I say that knowing full well what team I root for. Um, but we're going to dive into the Chiefs today and have our full uh, preview of, of the week six, excuse me, week seven matchup. Chargers play their sixth game against the Chiefs on the road in Arrowhead. Um, and uh, we'll dive into all of that. Um, a bit of a, a news situation first to dive into in terms of the safety position. Um, one last thing on the Cowboys. I do want to talk about this. We talked a lot about Tuli, Tui Poloto yesterday. That man is incredible to watch. I said this in the Discord today. I have the same feelings watching Thule that I did about watching Justin Herbert when he was a rookie. Certainly some things to clean up. Certainly some things to develop. But you just know when a guy is different. And the way that Thule plays is so much fun to watch on tape, man. And it's watching the tape i had basically like two moods it was just like kind of cackling at how good Thule is and then ripping my hair out about how frustrating the secondary was <laughs> against the cowboys um but Thule, man he's just he's an incredible watch he's so impactful to this team he's able to set the set the edge he's able to be disruptive at the point of attack he had this rep on kenneth murray's tackle for loss where he, he shot the gap and had a great play by kenneth murray Tyler Smith, the guard for the Cowboys, who's gaining a reputation as one of the most physical guards in the league, pulls across the formation. Thule takes him head on and puts him on his ass. And it was incredible to watch. And he's just doing stuff at such a high level right now. You know, bull rushing Terrence Steele, getting pressure on Dak Prescott, stacking and shedding Tyron Smith in the run. It's it's fun tape to watch, man. And, uh, you know, we said it as much on the Chargers channel yesterday, but he's consistently the most impactful defender the Chargers have right now. And he, he just turned 21 years old. Yeah, he is. And you you brought up a lot of plays. You highlighted a lot of plays. My focus more so watching was like watching Derwin and kind of what was going on mm -hmm. on defense with him in particular. But yeah, you highlighting some of those plays and then, you know, Tyler Biedas only gives up one sack since his rookie season in 2020 and week five of that year. And that was partially because of Thule and how disruptive he was to free up Morgan Fox on that sack. Just what he is as a one-on-one -on -one guy, as a power guy, as a guy against the run, as a force multiplier. Like this is, by the end of this year, if this continues, we're looking at a guy who we're going to put like top three or four in terms of Chargers players this season. And frankly, it, it's him and Keenan on for most consistent players this year. He's been awesome. And like you said, like you, you some guys just get it and you just get it and, and they just get it. And you can tell that they've got it. And the best film watchers are the ones that make you laugh, the ones that surprise you, because yeah. it's so funny how much they dominate opposing competition. And usually that's kind of like a uh, a college watch sort of thing or be yes. done to something ridiculous or this player uh -huh. is just infinitely better. But to do this as a rookie, as a second rounder, in the NFL against a very good Cowboys offensive line. And your reaction, like you said, while watching was to cackle and laugh because how good he was <laughs> just speaks to how good he's going to be in five more weeks or in, you know, five more years. Like, you know, even Joey Bosa said, it took me many years to finally be the body type and the bend and, and the physical whatever that he wanted to be. And Tully just stepped in and goes, yeah, whatever, dude, I'm 21. Here I go. 
<laughs> yeah, I'm not saying he's Max Crosby, but like it, that's kind of who it reminds me of, only because yeah, I think that Thule, you know, has a lot of refinement to go, obviously, but he's just a force of nature and disruptive with a high motor. And Crosby obviously is is, a, is much much better these years, but when he first started, he was just a relentless freak force of nature. And that's what yeah. And so if that's kind of what the Chargers are heading for with Thule, you're doing pretty good. Yeah, hundred percent. Um, you know, I remember watching tape of Max Crosby as a rookie and, and granted the Chargers offensive tackle situation was, was much different than it is now, um, at that time. But, you know, like you mentioned, it was chase down blocks. It was setting the edge. It was just effort rushes. And that's a lot of what Thule's doing right now. Um, his, his pressure on when one of his pressures on Dak, he hit Terrence Steele with kind of an in and out and then speed to power. And it was really, really fun to, to watch. I, I tweeted about it. So. You know, he has some power variations to his game, but, you know, he doesn't win a whole lot with like swipe, like the double swipe that Joey does or like an arm over. Like it's a lot of speed to power. It's a lot of in and out. It's a lot of just like sheer effort. Um, but it's a great spot to be in because you have Giff Smith, you have Joey Bosa, who have just refined his craft over the years. And so um, he's in a great spot and uh, I expect him to continue to get better and improve at it, which is a scary, scary thought. So. Um, definitely wanted to talk about it, Thule, again, because we just watched it. Um, spoiler alert, I'm going to be interviewing Thule Tui. Oh my gosh, I messed it up. Dang it. I will be interviewing Thule Tui Pelotu on Friday, so uh, stay tuned for that one. should be a fun conversation, and I'm going to ask him about some of this stuff. So um, really excited about that one. Excellent synergy there with the All In episode dropping on Thursday and then yeah. interviewing him on Friday. So. Pretty good there. I don't know if that was intentional, but I appreciate the Chargers for letting you interview Thule. And Seriously. hey, that's a that's a heck of an interview. I mean, there's no more positive story I think this year than, than what Thule's been doing. So, you know, a bright spot and some very dark moments uh, in losses. So excited yeah. to see what he has to say and and for you to pick his brain. Yeah, hundred percent. All right, I mentioned the news thing. Um, Charger safety Raheem Lane has a torn ACL. Unfortunately, um, just a, a terrible scene for him. A guy who has really established himself as a, a core four special teams player for the Chargers, um, one of Ryan Ficken's favorites. You know, he was the guy who, uh, in the, against the Colts, I want to say, you know, one of the Colts gunners got a got a bit of a, a, a lick on DeAndre Carter, and uh, Ryan Ficken said, "Hey, Raheem Lane, you're going to be my guy here. Just go blow that dude up." And he went and did it. And uh, you know, it, it, he's a core four special teams player. Flash some good things in the preseason. Um, so it's unfortunate for him. Um, the Chargers did claim Jalen Hawkins from the Atlanta Falcons uh, to essentially take his place on the roster. Uh, I reached out to some of my Falcons friends, and they mentioned that you know he, he's pretty comfortable in zone coverages. He's comfortable as, a, as an off-ball cover guy. Not super great in man-to-man -man situations, but his biggest asset is just his size and physicality in the run game. Uh, as a blitzer is something that they mentioned. Um, so kind of fits from what I can hear, at least a similar mold to Mark Webb, to Raheem Lane um, as that for safety. Uh, you know, we'll see what happens there, but um, and we'll see what happens with Alohi Gilman coming back if if he comes back this week. Um, but I think it just kind of goes to show how urgent it was for them to get a handle on this safety room with Raheem Lane out and Alohi Gilman still kind of dealing with that injury. Yeah, a lot of question marks. Really, this for me was the special teams aspect of it, where Dean Leonard, he'll be back, but he was out the last couple of games. Yeah. And, you know, if Jaws is going to be obviously starting and he is, how much how much more guys do you have to rotate through with the DB group? Um, and so getting someone like Hawkins is awesome. I, I didn't see that he had played many defensive snaps. This year seems more of a special teams thing. And also, shout out, it sounds like DeMarco Hellams, uh, the safety is going to be taking on a bigger role in Atlanta. So, you know, yay, the one draft guy that I had like ninth <laughs> ranked. Uh, but hey, you know, that, that's a familiar name. I'm happy with that. So I, I'm glad they jumped on this. Ian Rappaport pointed out that there were other teams that were interested and put in waiver claims um, for Hawkins. So clearly there was interest around the league. And I'm glad yep. the Chargers got him. You know, we'll see what happens with the safety group. But look, I didn't know who Dean Marlowe was five weeks ago. Now it's like, Hey, that's pretty good safety depth, and he's you know stopping fourth and one tush pushes and whatnot. So yeah, um, I'm not saying that's what Hawkins is going to be, but I'll take it. I'll take some veteran uh, play in the secondary right now. Yeah, and you know we'll see what happens. Uh, JT Woods, I think, has to miss at least two more games. We'll see what happens with his his health. You know, we don't really know what is going on there. Uh, 
So theoretically, Chargers safety room getting some reinforcements, getting healthier. Um, so definitely had to mention that one with Jalen Hawkins, uh, former Cal Bear coming over. Um, all right, Tyler, let's uh, let's start our deep dive here on the Kansas City Chiefs. Um, obviously, a, a team that Chargers fans are very familiar with. It's going to be very interesting to see how this dynamic plays out this week. The Chiefs, I feel like, are are probably the most different Patrick Mahomes Chiefs team right now. A um, lot of changes, a lot of stylistic things going on here, and I'm uh, excited to uh, dive in here. Love the uh, the frog reference, uh, and it says Ribbit 2023 season under here for our audio audience, obviously a reference to Mr. Patrick Mahomes. Yes. Now you see my preview, and hopefully you believe in my preview. <laughs> <laughs> Nicely done. Nicely done. Thank you. Um, all right. Uh, head coaching staff, or not head coaching staff, excuse me. Coaching staff had a, a bit of a turnover on offense, but for the most part, this group has been in intact for quite some time. Obviously, Andy Reid is the head coach. He's getting up there in age, but I, I do not expect him to retire anytime soon. Uh, with the kind of golden ticket quarterback at this point. Um, defensive coordinator, Steve Spagnolo, a guy who a lot of film nerds really have a high respect for because of what he does on a year-to-year -year basis. Um, you know, from a blitz perspective, from a development perspective, his teams always seem to find a way to peak towards the end of the season, it feels like. Um, offensive coordinator Matt Nagy is uh, the former Bears head coach, if that name sounds familiar to you. He was a quarterback's coach last year for the Chiefs after getting fired from Chicago. And then uh, Dave Tube, 11th season with the Chiefs, I believe came over with Andy to be his special teams coordinator. Traditionally, the Chiefs have a very strong special teams unit. So uh, Tyler, Matt Nagy is the difference here. What are you making of his debut as chiefs offensive coordinator for them this year uh, well they're still fourth and drop back epa so i guess they're doing okay in that regard i i'm surprised the rush epa is what it is i haven't really paid attention to the chiefs on a game to game to game to game basis but i feel like every time i watch them they're pretty solid um i've done some prize picks lesses on isaiah pacheco and he keeps getting more so i'm going to assume <laughs> that he's at least doing pretty well there um uh -huh. So yeah, overall, it, the offense isn't quite, you know, what we saw in, I guess, the heydays of, you talked about a very pa different Patrick Mahomes era kind of team. That's definitely partially about the defense, but also just the way they approach things with the players that they have. You know, Hardman has obviously gone, Tyreek Hill was gone the previous year. And so they don't really do that whole thing that they used to anymore. It is very much so centered on a quick passing game, very short passes. You know, we, we talked about Dallas Cowboys and, and their offense. I think the Chiefs were either one tick above or below them in A dot and intended air yards and whatnot. Um, the difference is you have Mahomes, you have Reed, you have Kelsey, and as long as you have those three, you're going to be good. A la fourth and drop back EPA. Yeah, I, I'm also surprised by the rush EPA. Um, the offensive line, I think, you know, the the tackle situation is is curious here, but the interior offensive line of the Chiefs is, in my opinion, the best in the league. Um, you have potentially the best center in the league now in Creed Humphrey, you know, Joe Tooney's playing at a really high level and, and Trey Smith. Those are all really great run blockers. And Isaiah Pacheco, you look, you look at his stats, cover your years, Alex Hensdorf. Um, you know, he's top 10 in the league in rushing right now, 387 yards uh, on the season um, yards after contact per attempt among rushers with 50% of their team's carries. He's sixth in the league at 3.29, only behind Brees Hall, Raheem Moster, Jerome Ford, uh, another Alex Insdorf uh, running back there, Christian McCaffrey and James Conner. Uh, he's ahead of B. John Robinson, ahead of Kenneth uh, uh, Kenneth Walker. He's ahead of Derrick Henry. Uh, missed tackles forced. He's sixth in the league with 22, only trailing again Travis Etienne, who has 29, which is crazy. Uh, McCaffrey, Moster, Walker, and then uh, my guy, Zach Moss with 23. So you look at the numbers for the run game of the Chiefs, and it looks good. Like, uh, I'm surprised by that ranking that, I don't know, maybe they're just like from a consistency standpoint, they're not the best at this point in time, but um, it, it's going to be a tough matchup for the Chargers. We talked about yesterday on the Chargers channel how much improved the run defense has been. I would say this is a, potentially their biggest test of the year in terms of offensive line talent, running back talent, 
um, you know, they're certainly clicking, I feel like, more than than the other teams they played. So this is going to be a tough spot for them. They've got to figure out a way to, to stay consistent in that regard and make sure that you're limiting the explosive plays from Isaiah Pacheco. Yeah, the Chargers have done a great job of doing that. Um, rewatching the game against the Cowboys, I really just felt, and we talked about this already, so it's not a surprise, but it really just confirmed how good the front of the Chargers was playing. Yeah. Um, so a game like this, I, I certainly think they're ready for it. Certainly think they're more ready for it than they were last year. It really just comes down to the whole Travis Kelsey thing. Yeah, you mentioned uh, Austin Johnson having his best game of the season. I feel like that as well. Starting to round into form, you know, uh, you know, the first four games, not super impactful, um, obviously coming off of the knee injury. If Austin Johnson can find his form from last season with Nick Williams playing the way he has and Sebastian Joseph Day playing that way and Klimak and Tooley, like it's it's got the potential to be the a really solid run defense group for this team. They're definitely an above average unit right now in that regard. So um, like you mentioned, I think if Austin Johnson can can be that guy again, and you feel pretty good about where they're at. And Kenneth Murray's playing well. It is an, an underrated storyline right now. What he's doing as a run defender coverage is still kind of dicey. But um, as a run defender, he's much more decisive right now. He's he's playing faster and more physical. And it's been, been a, a good watch. Good to see the growth from Kenneth Murray so far this year. Mm -hmm. All right. Additions and losses? Yes. All right. Uh, I think we know at least one of the additions that we – <laughs> talk about because he's starting for them now but um Juwan taylor and donovan smith it, it, it's so interesting when a team subs out both tackles what kind of effect you have um from a loss of standpoint obviously orlando brown jr um less notable but andrew wiley got a pretty decent contract to to leave and go with eric b enemy to the washington commanders so you have these two tackles and swapping in and out um Juwan Taylor has obviously caught a lot of flack online and now he's he's getting the penalties for his false starting so it, it is a curious thing to look at um Charles Omenahu the edge rusher slash five technique kind of guy he's very similar to like an Arden Key type he'll make his regular season debut for the Chiefs this week and then obviously uh Drew Tranquil former Charger uh was not starting for them Nick Bolton is injured right now so he is starting for them so there is a revenge game factor here going on. But uh, let's let's go to the offensive tackle situation here first, Tyler. What do you make of their decision to swap out their guys who had started for some time and going with uh, Juwan Taylor and Donovan Smith instead? A bit of a surprise. I don't recall what the contract was between the two, but I don't remember it being significantly different either way. Um, I don't know if Orlando Brown Jr. just wanted more and the Chiefs were like, whatever, just get out of here. And he didn't end up getting more. <laughs> Um, but it's definitely a surprise. I don't usually see teams do that. And I certainly don't usually see them do that. And it doesn't involve like a draft pick, like a, oh, we're getting Rashawn Slater. Great. You know, that there's your new tackle. No, they went out in free agency and, and got this done. It hasn't been great. The numbers haven't been great. And currently, as you said with Taylor, um, 11 accepted penalties so far in six games. That puts them on pace for 32 on the season, which is My a lot. <laughs> He, which That's is not insane. good. <laughs> yeah. Um, his previous career high was 14 accepted. So 32 would be a bit of a step up. And that was his rookie year, obviously. Wow. Um, do I expect that to continue? Not necessarily. Um, I think he had either zero or one penalties in week one where everyone was up in arms about the whole thing. And then the second week, he had five penalties where it seemed like the NFL had to crack down on, on whatever that was. And yeah, they there, benched been, him that week. They took him yeah. out because the penalties were so bad. Yeah. And, and so from then, it's been kind of like zero, one, two, two, zero. Like it hasn't been like four every week. But yeah. it, again, he's currently averaging two. And that's great. Um, you know, the, the Dallas Cowboys certainly didn't help themselves with their penalties. And if the Chiefs want to go ahead, and if Juwan Taylor wants to go ahead and pick up penalties, fine by me. And I think he will because of the guys that he's facing. You know, Joey seems probably poised to be even more healthy this week. Khalil, of course, Tuli, the way he's playing. Um, it's it's certainly, I feel, I think, better about the Chargers edge rushers versus the Chiefs tackles. I feel better about this matchup than I have, I think, in some time, especially because they have a third guy who can absolutely crush it. Yeah, the third guy is certainly going to make a big difference, but... Listen, man, I'm sure Joey is is highly motivated this week to go back <laughs> up against Jawan Taylor. 
Um, you know, we'll we'll see how that one goes and see how much Joey is going to be able to play. The Chargers did not practice today. We're, we're we are recording this on Wednesday, um, but the Chargers did an estimated injury report from a walkthrough and put Joey as limited. Um, so again, we'll have to see how the week goes. Um, he certainly does not look like himself right now. I think the toe is really impacting him. Um, hopefully he's able to get healthier and healthier and I'm sure he will, but, uh, you know, revenge game against a guy who, who kind of embarrassed you a little bit last time he played is a hell of a motivating factor. So, uh, hopefully Joey comes out here, but Donovan Smith, man, like he's not playing well right now and playing offensive tackle for Patrick Mahomes. It can be, I'm sure, a tad frustrating because Patrick will drop so deep sometimes and really invites pressure. So your numbers are not going to look like super clean all the time. But at the same time, like Donovan Smith, his pass blocking efficiency rating right now is is 95.9. Um, that's definitely a below average number. I, ideally, you're trying to get to like at least 96.5 from a pass blocking efficiency standpoint. That's at least like average. Um, so 95.9, that's, that's not going to cut it for a team that, uh, you know, has definitely Super Bowl aspirations. So very cur- curious to see how the Chargers attack that. Um, Donovan Smith is going to get a lot of Cleo Mack and they've played each other in the past and Cleo Mack has had his way with Donovan Smith. So, um, it is going to be a matchup to watch. I don't know if we'll, we'll feature that one later, but, um, offensive tackle, very curious. Um, all right, Tyler, what? <laughs> What are you expecting from Mr. Drew Tranquil this week? Uh, the revenge game that we're all expecting. <laughs> it's literally the perfect linebacker for the perfect Chiefs linebacker room yeah. with the perfect defensive coordinator and the perfect situation where the Chargers offensive line isn't picking up the exotic stuff that's being thrown at them. I, I expect this to be not fun to watch I'll, I'll say that much if you filter to the 20 percent snap threshold drew Tranquil. <clears throat> sorry there's a cough there i'm done <laughs> oh god what happened <laughs> <laughs> anyway yeah it's killing me that drew Tranquil left okay let's try this again yeah there you go <laughs> uh he filtered to 20 percent drew Tranquil is seventh in run stop rate 10th in pass rush productivity and 12th in pass rush win rate um, he's cut down his missed tackle rate from last year, 15.3, to this year, 5.7. He's currently on pace for more run stops, pressures, and sacks in his entire career. And for what it's worth, his passer rating when targeted is also lower of the lowest of his career outside of playing two snaps in one year, um, which doesn't count for your passer rating all that much. So basically, even though he didn't play week one, he's on pace for the best raw totals of his career in pressures, sacks, run stops. And he's also the best per play guy he's been of his career in productivity, win rate, run stop percentage, missed tackles, or missed tackle rate, I should say. So, yeah, what do I expect in the revenge game against the Chargers? I expect a heck of a revenge game, unfortunately. And I'm sure there's maybe some aspects where it's like, well, you know, Brandon still knows Drew Tranquil and the Chargers know Drew Tranquil. That is true. But then the same can be said of, you know, Drew Tranquil knowing the Chargers very well. So, um, yeah, not excited to see Drew Tranquil jump in front of Trey McKitty for a pick six. That's for sure. Okay. Well, Trey McKitty doesn't run that many routes. <laughs> I think we're safe at that part. <laughs> um, but, yeah, man, when when Tranquil signed there, I was like, damn it, that's a really perfect fit for him. <laughs> yeah. Um, because Steve Spagnuolo, just, he does this with linebackers. I mean, he made, like, Ben Neiman look like a quality linebacker for all those years, and now – this linebacker room that the Chiefs have is 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 not fair, man. I mean, you're talking about Drew Tranquil as your linebacker for now he's starting because Nick Bolton, who I think is one of the best in the business, is injured. Uh, yeah, so Drew Tranquil, is a, a, we we knew for years how good he was as a blitzer, and now he gets to play for Steve Smagnola, who's arguably the best blitz designer in the league. Uh, yeah, that's a good fit. So the Chargers offensive line, like you mentioned, um, the, the biggest thing that they're struggling – is these five man rushes where one of them is is a looper whether that's from one usually it's for the right side it, it's jamari and trey and will clap not being super connected on that side which isn't a huge surprise you know it's it's a guy who's never played right guard until this season jamari he's never played next to trey he's he's gotten some reps ne- next to will clap in the preseason and stuff like that but 
there's just not a lot of like connective tissue right now. And they have this problem where the guy like usually have like a wide nine kind of alignment. Sometimes it's a linebacker. Sometimes it's an edge rusher will loop all the way around towards will clap towards the center. And then the person that's lining up next to Jamari or in front of Jamari who is trying to split the two of them. And then they'll have the other guy kind of do a regular rush or whatever. Um, that's, you know, closer towards Trey. And there, there's just a, a lack of connective tissue there. You know, Max Crosby hit Herbert twice on a look like that. Micah Parsons got the sack. Um, you know, obviously this past week, Jeffrey Simmons and Harold Landry were successful with that same kind of concept. And so that right side, I expect them to get better. I, you know, Jamari is, he's too good at everything else. Like I do think he's playing really, really well overall outside of the, the stunt factor. And I think Trey is a solid offensive tackle. So I do expect it to get better, but this week is a bad week to struggle against stunts and blitzes because that's everything that Steve Spagnuolo does and believes in. So the, the charge offensive line is going to have their hands full and uh, hopefully we don't see Drew get a sack because that would be not fun. It, it'll, it'll probably happen. I mean, <laughs> Herbert's very good at avoiding sacks. So at least there's that, yes. but he's certainly go he's going to get some hits at least. Um, yeah. And now the Chiefs get to unleash Charles Amenahu, who's going to come back after having 62 pressures and seven sacks last season and just contribute to more of the chaos. So not only are they really good at this anyway, I believe the Chiefs are, I wrote it somewhere, I think they're like second in pressure rate in the NFL right now. Yeah. Um, now you're adding a guy with 62 pressures and seven sacks. So it's going to be a heck of a day. I mean, this Chiefs defense is so much better than I can remember them ever being. And before the season started, you know, we looked at the front seven and figured, and even though there's the whole defense, and like if everyone takes a step forward like they're supposed to, this is easily going to be the best defense they've had, maybe the whole Andy Reid era. And so far, I mean, they've been second EPA since week two when they didn't have Chris Jones and they weren't playing Drew Tranquil. Like it's it's amazing. They're they're I think eight points per game better than they were last year. Like you give Patrick Mahomes a defense that is eight points per game better in terms of yeah. points per game allowed. That is that's horrifying and not a surprise the Chiefs are atop the division right now. Yeah, I mean, Steve Spagnuolo, he won a Super Bowl with the Giants back in the day with, you know, one of the best defensive fronts in the league. And I think this defensive front can can match what he had back then. Um, so it, it's uh, eight points better on, on defense. That's a huge jump <laughs> forward. Um, and we haven't even really talked about the secondary, which has some really pieces, some some really very talented pieces. Trent McDuffie, Legereus Sneed, chief among them playing some really good football. So uh, we'll wrap up this conversation, uh, diving back into the draft class. The Chiefs last year obviously had a great draft class. This year, not a lot of ton of guys contributing. Uh, Felix Enrique Uzama has played a little bit, um, but again, he's, he's kind of stuck with a, a pretty loaded group in front of him. Um, Rasheed Rice, just kind of solidly producing for them. Um, we can dive into his, his play a little bit if we want to, but um, good impact there. He's basically kind of like their Juju Smith-Schuster this year. Not a ton of impact, but just consistently making plays over the middle. Uh, Wanya Morris, I loved him coming out of Oklahoma. We'll see what happens if he becomes kind of their left tackle of the future once Donovan Smith moves on, but he's not playing a whole lot right now. Jamari Connor, BJ Thompson, Keandre Coburn, Nick Jones. I think I don't think Nick Jones made the roster. I think the other guys did, but they're all kind of uh, end of the line group. So Last year, the, the Chiefs got a ton of instant production from their rookie class. This year, not so much, but um, filling in some death pieces for sure. Yeah, it seems like it's, um, I mean, Rasheed Rice is contributing quite a bit right now, but it feels like these guys are just loaded, trying to load up depth, get maybe to the next guy. You know, after you lose Donovan Smith, maybe next year, does Wanya yeah. Morris become that guy? Um, we'll see what happens with the addresses they currently have, but can Felix Enrico Zama take a bigger step next year? They're just loaded. I mean, kind of the... I don't want to say it in the same way the Chargers are loaded at premium positions because I feel like, well, Quentin Johnson is not producing right now. But they, the Chargers and the Chiefs both did invest in these premium spots, and it is helping them. Rasheed Rice, it's funny, you know, the, the argument really for me about receiver for the Chargers this year wasn't as much who you take in the first round. It's do you wait and take someone on day two, you know, in the second or third round because there isn't really that big of a drop-off. And, you know, guys like Rasheed Rice, I mean, you look at the top 10, you know, 15 guys in terms of yards this year among rookies, you know, it's Puka Nakua, obviously. Then you have Zay Flowers, but then it's Tank Dell, Michael Wilson, then Jordan Addison. 
but then Josh Downs, Marvin Mims, Rasheed Rice, Jaden Reed, Demario Douglas, Jonathan Mingo, Jalen Hyatt, etc. Like the Chiefs did a really good job of finding a receiver on day two that could work in their system and contribute. And so far, the 200, what is it, 45 yards that he has, um, two touchdowns, 21 catches. You know, yeah. is it is it world breaking? Not necessarily. But he's, he's contributing very well, and he just had his best game, so it seems like he's trending up too. Yeah, he's he's kind of their middle of the field merchant right now. He, he's being tasked with a lot of zone beater concepts, yards after catch, and uh, the Chargers certainly will have to be aware of of where he's at because he's he's really earning Patrick Mahomes' trust right now. Um, Sky Moore, Kadarius Tony, not so much. Um, you know, it is what it is there, but. Rishi Rice is, is kind of becoming their their best receiver. You know, it's certainly the most productive right now. Um, so we'll have to keep an eye on that one. <clears throat> All right here. Uh, before we get uh, further into this matchup, I have to tell you guys about some of our sponsors. First and foremost, we have Ticketmaster. It's always more fun to be there live for Los Angeles Chargers football. And when you need tickets, Ticketmaster has you covered. As the official marketplace of the Los Angeles Chargers and the NFL, Ticketmaster gives you more ways to find your perfect seat. Their interactive map gives you a 360-degree preview of your section to make sure you have the best view of those pivotal plays on game day. And if your plans change, Ticketmaster gives you more flexibility to sell or transfer your tickets to somebody else. Plus, mobile tickets make getting in on game day a breeze, and you can even customize your Ticketmaster app to rep your team's colors. You may uh, use the app and go find tickets today at Ticketmaster.com slash Chargers. Again, the official ticket ma uh, marketplace of the Los Angeles Chargers and the NFL, Ticketmaster.com slash Chargers. And I'm here to talk about Price Picks. So Price Picks is a skill-based real money daily fantasy sports game. How does it work? You pick two to six players, and if they will go more or less than their Price Picks projection, watch your progress update in real time. Went up to 25 times your entry amount. And cash out your winnings with quick scoring, settling, and withdrawals. My mom went two for two last week on prize picks. The story of every week is somehow that my mother is very, very <laughs> uh, good at doing this whole more or less thing. Um, so go for it. Use our um, discount code. Go to prizepicks.com slash guilty and use killed guilty for a first deposit match up to $100. That's prizepicks.com slash guilty and use code guilty for a first deposit match up to $100. One of my favorites this week is Gardner Minshew less than 218.5 passing yards against the Cleveland Browns. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> Take the less against whoever is playing the Browns. I think that's that's been proven so far. Uh, potentially the best defense in the NFL right there alongside the 49ers. Uh, all right, last one here. Uh, Little Caesars. Make Little Caesars the official pizza sponsor. Uh, part of your NFL game day experience. Uh, we all know how synonymous football is with pizza. It's kind of like Keenan Allen and Justin Herbert on game day. You can order online during our pizza pizza pregame one hour before and three hours after the NFL officially kicks off on Sunday afternoons. Uh, you can get ready for some football and fun. Make sure and choose your favorite Little Caesars pizza or pick the toppings you crave. And either way, you win. Speaking of winning, everyone scores with convenient delivery or our in-store pizza porta pickup. So grab some friends and enjoy a few slices during the Los Angeles Chargers game on Sunday afternoon this week. All right, Tyler, uh, let's get into this this matchup. We'll we'll start with the X factor of the game for you. Um, you you got to pick one guy who's going to maybe go under the radar a little bit, making it make a big impact on the game. Who's your choice for X factor of the week for the Chargers this week? I'm going D Marlowe. I think he's a player that has functioned well with the Chargers so far. Um, I think back-to-back -back weeks now, at least one standout play against the run, one as a tackle for loss against Josh Jacobs in the, the Raiders week. And this week, not as much a running back, but that diving over the pile and stopping the the quarterback sneak, the tush push. Uh, I think Dak Prescott said they didn't push his tush enough. Well, part of that was because <laughs> Dean Marlowe was trying to drag him down from behind. And, you know, Austin Johnson and, and Scott Matlock did their thing too. But he's really a player that, has become kind of an X factor for this team, a player that I did not have any expectations for. Frankly, if he went out there and was terrible, fine. Like, that's fine. Trey Marshall. Like, that's, like, sure, exactly, exactly. We've seen this song and dance before. And so to get a guy who's actually a plus out there and making plays 
if nothing else, just a couple of splash plays holding up in the post. That's huge. So I think he's going to my X factors this year or not this year, excuse me, this game. Well, I think you could say this year too. I think that's <laughs> fair. Uh, he, he's playing in some plays, man. He's, he's defending the run. Well, you, you mentioned the tush push. I think he had another key tackle uh, in space against Tony Pollard this week. So uh, I think that's a good call. Um, my X factor, I'm going to go with Cameron Dicker here this week. Ooh, uh, okay. Somebody that I, I think has been obviously pretty consistent for the Chargers, but at the same time, not getting a ton of field goal opportunities, which I think is generally a good thing. <laughs> um, when your kicker's not kicking a lot of field goals, it means you're probably scoring a lot of touchdowns. And we've, we've seen the Chargers be pretty efficient in the red zone. Um, they had some miscues this past week, but overall, they generally score a touchdown in the red zone more often than not when it comes to you know their league ranking they're still top six in the league right now um but the chiefs have a great red zone defense we just talked about the defensive line i think this could be a game where cameron dicker is, is kind of relied upon uh to kick some more field goals than usual and i think uh we might have to see him kick maybe a couple 50 yarders as well this week so um i think the Chargers offense it should rebound but at the same time this is a tough matchup and Cameron Dicker could be counted upon. Kicking in Kansas City has not been the easiest for anybody, especially Chargers kickers. Um, so I think this could be a game where we see Cameron Dicker maybe uh, make his imprint on the game a little bit more than we've seen in the past. So do you think they'd be more willing to kick it this week than maybe the last couple of weeks? Yeah, that's that's a fair point, uh, especially Brandon Staley has, has famously been very aggressive on fourth downs against the Chiefs in the past. Now that you mentioned that, I might change my pick. <laughs> well, it's kind of it depends, though, right? Like, I think yeah. it's very much so you use the numbers, but to guide you. So it, there are, it depends. It certainly depends, right? Yeah. Yeah, and I'm, I'll stick with Cameron Ticker, but I, I think he's been solid. I think this is a game where we can really get maybe an evaluation of where he's at. Tough place to play, tough place to kick. Maybe you have a game-winning field goal chance opportunity again. So uh, I'm going to stick with Cameron Ticker this week. Love it. All right, Tyler, uh, key matchup of the game. We've talked a little bit about some of them. I, I think we could certainly choose whoever is guarding Travis Kelsey, but uh, what's your choice this week for key matchup? No, we've already sort of talked about this one, which is how the Chargers handle Leo Chanel and Willie Gay and, of course, Drew Tranquil and how they handle a very aggressive front. I mean, these guys, Tranquil, Willie Gay, Leo Chanel, First of all, that's an unfair thing to say because I didn't even mention Dick Bolton yet, but he has been hurt. But on the season, those three guys, as more of the rusher types, they have 20 pressures and three sacks between them. And it's not like one guy's even dominating that. It's just one guy has seven, the other guy has seven, the other guy has six. I mean, these are three guys with a great defensive coordinator who can get after it. And as you talked about, you know, Jamari will clap. That interior just isn't getting it together right now. And so really that's the key matchup for me because I would – if I'm watching everything that you've seen in the last couple of weeks with Justin Herbert and the way that they've been able to pressure him and Herbert kind of looking off that last game, you're bringing it. I mean, they're bringing it anyway. Again, they they blitz, I think, top five in the league in terms of blitz rate and yeah. second in pressure rate with those, with well, in general. So again, 20 pressures from those three guys. Nick Bolton played the last game, so I think he'll be back in full capacity. We'll see. But man, like that is a tough quadro. What are they? What's four? Quartet. 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 Yeah. Whatever. Whatever you want to call them. They're aggressive and they're really good at rushing the passer, and so the Chargers have to be ready. Yeah. Well, obviously, you mentioned uh, Drew Tranquil and where he's at. Uh, Leo Chanel not far behind him in terms of rushing the passer efficiency. Um, I don't think Nick Bolton qualifies. So those are the two. Obviously, Nick Willie Gay is not super efficient, but they've all blitzed basically around thirty times each. Um, Willie Gay leads them with most blitzes at 29, Drew Tranquil 26, and then Leo Chanel, where was he at? Uh, 27 as well. So they blitz a lot. <laughs> That's nothing new that Steve Spagnolo and his DNA is, is to, uh, rush the passer and, and cause some havoc. So yeah, the Chargers are going to have to be on their P's and Q's in that regard. It, not super dissimilar to what they faced in Minnesota, although... <laughs> Jordan Hicks and Ivan Pace are one and two in most blitzes this year, both above <laughs> yeah. 60. So <laughs> Ryan Ooh. Flores is, is uh, doing some things up there in Minnesota. Um, all right. So for me, I think 
we we talked about the the matchup versus Isaiah Pacheco. That that was one that I think is is an interesting one you can highlight here. Tra- again, Travis Kelsey is you know he's a different kind of beast right now um, as he has always been. He's given the Chargers a ton of problems there. So I I don't know how much I want to talk about that one, but um, one thing I do want to mention here is, is just the aspect of the. Uh, the Chiefs edge rushers, you know, the the Chargers offensive tackles right now are kind of struggling a bit. Um, Brandon Staley mentioned that Rashawn Slater is playing through an ankle injury right now, and I think it has shown up. I think he's had, statistically speaking, his two worst games of his career back to back against the Raiders and against the Chiefs. Hopefully, he's able to be a little healthier this week. Um, but we mentioned Charles Omenahu, Chris Jones also playing on the edge a little bit more. Um, and, and George Karloftis, man, he's had he has 27 pres- pressures right now. He actually leads the team in pressures for them. Granted, he uh, has an extra game up on Chris Jones. Um, his win rate has increased this year up to 15%. Um, he's, he's really getting after it right now. And so is Mike, Mike Dana, who will shift into their third edge rusher role he has 16 pressures four sacks according to to pff not super efficient um but just it's really difficult right now when you have rashawn who's not healthy trey who's kind of matching up against these freakazoid edge rushers and you also have some stunt issues up the middle so the stunt issues might take some time but what you can't have is the stun issues and then also the the edge pressure. So, you know, they're not playing Micah Parsons this week. They're not playing Max Crosby this week. You, I hope the Chargers offensive tackles and specifically Rashawn Slater are able to bounce back because um, this is a team that Rashawn Slater has played incredibly well against in the past, and they're going to need him to do that again this week. So um, Rashawn Slater and also Trey Pipkins, but especially Rashawn, we need to see him bounce back, be his former self, be his usual self in order for this charge offense to, you know, really bounce back like we need them to see happen this week. Yeah, you said Rashawn Slater's game against the Chiefs last year was probably his best game and one of the best games that he's that you know a tackle could have played. And with this ankle injury, I assume that does not help one against guys like the Chiefs who love their power guys. Um yeah. How have you seen, if you've paid attention to it at all, I don't know if you have, how do you believe Rashawn's ankle has affected him at this point? Is it more of just a that classic anchor that he's shown is not really there as much anymore? Or is it more of a, a movement getting out of your stance sort of thing? It's definitely an explosive thing. It, okay. it, it's definitely hindering him out of his stance. Um, there were a couple of times where the Cowboys were wide nine, whether it was Demarcus Lawrence or, or Dante Fowler, and that's when they were able to beat him. And those... Those are traditionally what Rashawn likes to do against the wide nine is close the gap and get out in a hurry. You know, we'll see some offensive tackles prefer to deep set against a wide nine. Rashawn likes to go at them and close the gap, close the space. And he's not able to get out there as as fastly as we've seen him in the past. So it's mm-hmm. definitely an explosive thing. I think he had a good day as a run blocker. I think when it came to like power rushes, I still think he was able to hold his own. But it's it's hurting his explosiveness right now. And he's still way more explosive than most offensive tackles. Um, but at the same time, like you want Rashawn to be able to have his full arsenal and do what he's comfortable with. And like I said, he loves to get out there, be aggressive, quick set, get his hands on folks. And that's arguably what he does best as a pass protector. Hmm. And right now it's just not super clean because he, because of the ankle injuries is hampering him there. Yeah. That's a shame to hear. I just wanted to talk about the Travis Kelsey point just a little bit because sure. it really felt like not as much about Travis Kelsey here, but about Derwin James. It really felt like the plan for Derwin this past week. And I tried bugging Arjun about like entropy and how much he was used. Um, I believe the 33 free safety snaps that Derwin took were the most he's taken since like week five or six or something of 2021 um, of the Staley era. He did not play more than 33 free safety snaps last season this so 33 this past week was a lot more than we're used to seeing granted mm-hmm. he's played like 25 26 before but still 33 is quite a bit then again we kind of had a discussion of well why are we playing so deep against this particular team um but i, I do think that the cowboys they don't throw it deep but there were plenty of opportunities where or there were routes where they're trying to send guys deep whether that is ferguson or cooks or lamb or whatever and this feels very you know 
other than that, Mrs. Lincoln, how was the play? But mm. to me, other than the two penalties and rewatching the first roughing the passer or the only roughing the passer, ah, you know, I don't know how I feel about that <laughs> one in the end. But other than those two penalties and, of course, missing Dak on the touchdown, which is there are three critical things. I get that. But honestly, I thought Derwin James, outside of those terrible things, played a really great game of what he had to do. And part of that was playing deep, of course. The other part was covering um, Jake Ferguson. I think he yeah. was, if he wasn't playing deep, he was covering Jake Ferguson. And yeah. every time that he had the opportunity to do that, there was nothing for Ferguson. And so I think that sort of role, you know, he won't be one on one matched up right in front of Travis Kelsey. But if they extend this to this next upcoming week, I could see that role sort of working. But then again, Travis Kelsey, you know, we've seen in, in Mike Dubs and whatever, he just does gets to do whatever. And Mahomes knows how to find him. So it's a very different yeah. matchup. But I do think I want to give Derwin James some credit is what I'm trying to say. I thought outside of the three plays that weren't great, that he played great. Yeah, you mentioned the the snap alignment. Uh, PFF actually listed his his position as free safety this week, and they also did it uh, against the Vikings too. He, he left that game early, obviously due to the injury, but um, you know he had twenty seven free safety snaps out of fifty two um, that week against the Vikings. So maybe a bit of a, a changing of a role for Mister Derwin James happening right now. I think some of that is just kind of necessity, and I think. We're really seeing that Brandon Staley wants to stop allowing these explosive plays from happening. Um, and I think that's probably the key reason why they're playing off coverage so much, which is another debate, I guess. But um, if Derwin's going to play free safety, it, it, I, I think it helps the defense, but it probably hurts Derwin James. And Like, I don't think free safety is what he does best. Um, so we'll have to see what, what happens this week. I would love to see him get in the box, match up with Isaiah Pacheco a few times, you know, meet him in the hole kind of thing. Cause it, those two players are just so physical, so fast. Um, and then obviously I would like to see him covering Travis Kelsey a little bit. So um, yeah, interesting tidbits. I hadn't really looked at that until just now, but a lot of free safety snaps for Derwin James the last couple of weeks. Yeah. And you're right. I think it really is not helping Derwin James, the producer necessarily, but and is it his best role? No. But I do think it is helping the defense. I mean, they they did not really allow a, a deep ball. Um, of course, there was a drop by Gallup, but that wasn't on Derwin. That was on Dean Marlowe's side. Yeah. And then I forget that there's a big scramble one, but that, that's just a kind of an out of structure, different sort of thing. Otherwise, like I thought it really did benefit the defense for, for Derwin to be out there. So strange. A team that doesn't throw deep, it benefited them to have Derwin play deep. Like take your your in theory, your best DB and play him back against a team that doesn't throw it deep. And yet, watching the film, I actually saw how it benefited the Chargers. Unfortunately, when all you see are penalties and him missing Dak Prescott for a touchdown, yeah. you only see the mistakes, whereas watching the film, you see him playing back and playing really, really, really well. Yeah, 100%. Um, all right, let's get to let's, uh, wrap this conversation up today with our bold predictions. Um, Last week, obviously, not so hot. Both of us, uh, both of our X Factors last week uh, did not hit. Um, they are bold predictions, but Darius Davis, zero touches, and the Chargers obviously lost. So um, hopefully we'll be a little bit better this week in terms of the outcome. <laughs> That's Again. right. We did Darius Davis and the Chargers winning by double digits. Good Lord. Okay. Uh, yeah. The Darius Davis thing still doesn't make any sense to me. He played two snaps on like the first couple of drives and then nothing the rest of the game. I'm like, what? what is happening here? Anyways. Yeah. Uh, my bold prediction this week, I think we see Austin Eckler go over 90 yards rushing this week. I think the Chargers offensive line is, is pretty frustrated with the lack of rushing efficiency and, and everything, how it's been going. Um, Rashawn Slater and Trey Pipkins both told Daniel Popper after the game that they had a, a, a rush heavy approach heading into this Cowboys game and they just couldn't get anything going. Um, mm. and, uh, when the offensive line gets frustrated like that, that tends to provide a pretty, pretty good motivator. You haven't been pass protecting super well. So I, I think we do see the rush, the rush game get back on track a little bit this week. Um, actually, like, I don't think Austin Eckler is, is probably going for over 90 yards, but bold prediction going Austin Eckler over 90 yards. Yeah. I was surprised to see, we were discussing this, I think before the stream that the chiefs are 27th. What? Nope. I have it filtered incorrectly, but they're tw they're in the low twenties, high twenties, yeah. um, in terms of rushing defense. And I think that 
if you're looking at the Cowboys, their big weakness was actually against the run if they have one. And while that didn't work out, I understand why you'd have a run-heavy approach going into that game, especially with the rushes that they did have. So in this game, yeah, I kind of get it. So the Chiefs are, I promise I usually prepare for these things, 25th since week two in rush EPA, which include, you know, that's when Chris Jones came back. Yeah. So yeah, that's not a bad one there. Um, will he go over that much? I don't know. But again, it's bold predictions. I'm going with the tried and true one, which is only, I think the only time I've gotten a bold prediction right. So here we go. Gerald Everett, more receiving yards than Travis Kelsey this week. They laughed at me, Stephen. <laughs> they laughed at me. By they, I mean you and Alex. But we did. We did. <laughs> it was right once. I was right once. And I'm going to do it again. I'm going two for two. Gerald Everett, more receiving yards than Travis Kelsey because he deserves more involvement in yeah. this offense yeah. than, than what he got last game, which was a really great start and then nothing much after that. Yeah, and then the touching out the end, but mm -hmm. yeah, they. I think this is a game where you again, similar to the Cowboys, like you should be involving your yards after catch guys. Quentin, Darius, and Gerald Everett should should be getting more involvement this week because you got to be able to get the ball up quick, stretch the field a little bit more, and uh, we'll see what happens there. Um, getting back to the run defense, I will I, the rushing attack. I think one of the reasons why it has struggled recently is the tight end room shocker but what's happening a lot for these teams these defenses are really crowding the uh, the the line of scrimmage the box when the chargers go into 12 personnel the way that the cowboys did it like from a schematic standpoint because i'm a film nerd i actually like really loved what the cowboys were doing because they they would have four safeties on the field they would bring in like oh. this it is very similar to like what the Chargers did against the Ravens back in the day uh, in the playoff game out of necessity. Same kind of thing. The Char the, Ra the Cowboys didn't have a ton of linebackers, you know, healthy in this one. So they would either, either have Damone Clark or Micah Parsons as your one linebacker. And then they would have three safeties up at the line of scrimmage or in the box, essentially. And then you would have obviously their, their defensive line. The other thing that they did, which caused the Chargers problem, is that they had Jonathan Hankins and Mozzie Smith on the field at the same time, essentially mm -hmm. doing a, a double A-gap mug look from a defensive tackle standpoint. Mm -hmm. um, so the Cowboys, again, tip of the cap to Mr. Dan Quinn. I thought he had a really good game plan. Um, the Vikings obviously crowded the line of scrimmage. Um, you know, they were blitzing so much. And it, it's just given the, the Chargers some problems. They've been, I feel like, from the film perspective, Arjun can back this up or not. I feel like they're running into heavier boxes recently. And when you're not able to do a lot of the under center stuff that that you're taking out of the playbook with Justin Herbert's injury, it's it's causing them some issues. So I would look, if I'm Kellen Moore, I would maybe try and spread things out a little bit more, you know, maybe running out of empty packages, running without a tight end. You know, maybe we put some more of like the H back looks in this week and, and try and, and spread the Chiefs out a little bit. I think that's that's kind of the recipe for success on the ground this week. Interesting. I haven't gotten a chance to watch the offense and therefore not the, the Cowboys defense, but I'm really happy you loved watching the Cowboys play defense. That's really cool. <laughs> but, you know, league is about stealing things. Right. And so hopefully maybe there's maybe there's something there that the Brandon yeah. Staley could steal. Who knows? Yeah. Um, interesting. Interesting. Um, so. It's not necessarily that they're not blocking well as much as the Cowboys just didn't allow them to be have space to really do anything and just put their biggest run stoppers there. And that's part of it. But the, the Chargers really struggled to, to set the edges with the, the 12 personnel looks. So, you know, when you don't have great blocking tight ends and teams are loading the box, it's kind of a problem. But yes. Like I, I have a take right now that Gerald Everett is their best blocking tight end, uh, and that's kind of an issue. I'll do respect, but yeah, well, he at least has two functioning hands, two functioning wrists, so right. Right. that helps in this situation. Hey, we'll see Nick Bennett this week. We won't, but I keep saying that. Hopefully, that would be great because they need it. All right, Tyler, uh, any final thoughts before we uh, head out for the episode? Nope. Um, I realized I'm wearing black. So I guess I am giving a final thought. Um, hopefully it's not for a funeral. Um, this is it. So we'll see. We'll preview, obviously, the game 
wrap things up on Saturday. And then there's the season. The season is right in front of us. It could pivot in one of two directions. And we're about to find out which way. Yeah, this is definitely a real inflection point of the season. Can you get back to 500? Can you beat the Chiefs, get a signature bounce back win, create some momentum towards the end, of the se- towards the rest of the season? Or will you lose to the divisional opponent two and four? It's it's an inflection point for sure. Uh, two and four, uh, barring some some craziness where the other AFC teams lose. I was messing around with the New York Times playoff model. Uh, if the Chargers lose, their playoff odds fall to 20% on the season. So it is it is definitely a must win. You're not mathematically eliminated, but uh, three and three is much better than two and four. Uh, winning against the Chiefs on the road would do wonders for this season, I think, going forward. Mm-hmm. All right, uh, that's going to do it for us today. Hope you guys enjoyed the episode. Um, make sure, obviously, go check out our Wednesday episode on the Chargers feed if you missed that already. Um, Alex Katzen also released his uh, scouting roundup on, on Katzen's corner. Alex Insdorf had his bolt breakdown. Arjun should be dropping his video of the week shortly. Uh, and Jamison Omar will have us covered from an injury perspective here in a minute as well. Uh, Tyler and I will be live on Saturday for our usual Q&A. And then shortly after the game on Sunday, after the uh, Chargers and Chiefs uh, kick off and finish, we'll probably go live before Sunday Night Football, maybe after. I don't know. We'll decide and we'll let you guys know. But we will be live on Sunday. Uh, all right. That's going to do it for us. Make sure and leave us a rating or review and all that good stuff. We'll see you guys next time. As always, bolt up.